What I'd like to do today is examine a tool that's been used by Satan to deceive mankind virtually since the very beginning of time. And that tool is the false prophet. And we all know about the false prophet who is going to be around at the end. But the warning has come down to Israel and through Israel to the early church and through them to us that false prophets would appear all of the time. We saw during the time of Jeremiah there were false prophets. We saw in the early church that there were false prophets. In fact, the prophetic utterances of the time indicated that we would be played with false prophets even today. And Jesus even warned us about that, that many would come in His name saying that He was the Christ or Jesus, but would deceive many. And that deception is the very hallmark of the false prophet. If you'll turn to Jeremiah 23, in just one verse there, verse 16, we see that the false prophet was, in fact, around during the days of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, 16 says, The Lord Almighty said to the people of Jerusalem, Do not listen to what the prophets say, for they are filling you with false hopes. They tell you what they have imagined, and not what I have said. And that's the hallmark of the, of the false prophet that we should be watching for. If you'll turn over to Ezekiel 13, you'll see that even during his days, there were false prophets. Ezekiel 13, and beginning in verse 9, just two verses here. I'm about to punish you prophets who have false visions and make misleading predictions. You will not be there when my people gather to make decisions. Your names will not be included in the list of the citizens of Israel. You will never return to your land. Then you will know that I am sovereign Lord. The prophets mislead my people by saying that all is well. All is certainly not well. My people have put up with a wall of loose stones, and then the prophets have come and covered it with whitewash. So that's a pretty, pretty stiff... Uh, put down of the prophets. And for some reason, my message has disappeared on me. There it is. I'm still getting used to this, this thing. I've only had it a year. <laughs> it's not the focus of our, of our message here to talk about the false prophet, but I wanted to go ahead and bring up something about him. And you'll see that in Revelation 16 and beginning in verse 13. Well, just one verse there where John was inspired to write, Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. So this is someone, some very specific individual. Verse, uh, Re Revelation 19 and verse 20. The beast was taken prisoner together with the false prophet who had performed miracles in his presence. It was by those miracles that he had deceived those who had the mark of the beast and who had worshipped the image of the beast. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So this false prophet and many false prophets that are out there today can in fact do miracles. So we don't want to allow miracles to distract us from what in fact uh, the, the false prophet is saying. Just one chapter over, Revelation, in verse, uh, 20, Revelation 20 and verse 10. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there is the, the end result for the false prophet, the false prophet, the one that's going to be one of the three at the end that, uh, that deceives the entire world the one that will do all of these great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if were even possible, the very elect. So let's look at that word, uh, that set of words, false prophet. It's a, it comes from a Greek word, it's translated from a Greek word, pseudoprophetes, and it means a spurious prophet or false prophet, or a pretended foreteller or an imposter. So whatever this false prophet is, he's, he's an imposter and he's not speaking what God wants him to speak. We have the word in the English 
called pseudo that comes from that word, a part of that word, which means not genuine and not authentic. It doesn't come from God. And that means even in spite of appearances, it's not, it's not true or authentic. And then the word prophetes, it is um, the forerunner of our word prophet, and it means a foreteller. So pseudo prophetes means someone who is not genuine who attempts to foretell. And again, we saw that in the Old Testament where, the, where God condemns those prophets for saying everything is well when everything wasn't well. 2 Thessalonians 2 and chapter 3. One false prophet that will appear. We've read a little, read a little bit about him a minute ago. Uh, but Paul was inspired to write about this particular one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 3. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the final rebellion takes place and the wicked one appears, who is destined to hell. He will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Now, God's temple as a brick-and-mortar building ended shortly after the death of Christ, or right at the death of Christ. We all know that the veil was ripped at two from the top and the bottom. So whatever this temple is that's being talked about as being God's temple is not the brick-and-mortar temple that we're expecting to see in Jerusalem. At least in my opinion, it's not. We also can read in Ezekiel 8, and I'm not going there, uh, about some imposters that, that rise up in the temple in the end time. Going on, 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. Don't you remember I told you all this while I was with you? Yet there's something that keeps this from happening now, and you know what it is. At the proper time, then, the wicked one will appear. The mysterious wickedness is already at work. But what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back is taken out of the way. Then the wicked one will be revealed. But when the Lord Jesus comes... He will kill him with the breath from his mouth and destroy him with his dazzling presence. The wicked one will come with the power of Satan and perform all kinds of false miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth so as to be saved. And so God sends the power of error to work in them so that they believe what is false. And that's what God did with the false prophets of the old times. He sent them a false vision so that when they went and talked to the king about what was going to happen, they were giving them a false prophecy and the kings would go out and they would act on that and they would fall. We saw that more than once in the Old Testament. But more importantly there, what we're seeing is that this particular wicked one, this false prophet, he comes with the power of Satan and performs all kinds of false miracles and wonders. So we have to really get it into our mind that the wonders that we're going to see are not what to look for whenever we hear someone speaking. We need to hear that they speak out of the Word of God, the truth, and nothing else. Uh, turn over to Acts 13, and we'll start there in verse 2. We find that false prophets and did in fact exist in the early church, and they were recorded for our benefit even now. Acts 13 and verse 2. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to do the work to which I have called them. And they fasted and prayed, placed their hands on them and sent them off. Having been sent by the Holy Spirit, okay, this is a pretty good indication that they're not false. This Holy Spirit sent them. Barnabas and Saul went to Seleucia and sailed from there to the island of Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues. They had John Mark to help them in the work. They went all the way across to the, uh, the island to Paphos, to Paphos, where they met a certain magician named Bar-Jesus, or bar Jesus in the Greek, a Jew who claimed to be a prophet. Now this word bar Jesus or Bar-Jesus, as it's translated into English, it is Chaldean in origin. It means the son of Jesus. That's what the word bar means. So here was somebody claiming to be the son of Jesus all along. And he, this bar Jesus, verse 7, 
was a friend of the governor of the island, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor called Barnabas and Saul before him because he wanted to hear the word of God. But they were opposed by the magician Elymas, and that's his name in the Greek, who tried to turn the governor away from the faith. Then Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked straight at the magician and said, You son of the devil, you are the enemy of everything that is good. You are full of all kinds of evil tricks, and you always keep trying to turn the Lord's truths into lies. The Lord's hand will come down on you now. You will be blind and will not see the light of day for a time. And at once, Elymas felt a dark mist cover his eyes, and he walked around trying to find someone to lead him by the hand. When the governor saw what had happened, he believed, for he was greatly amazed at the teaching about the Lord. This man had gone, his name was Elymas, but he had adopted the term Bar-Jesus, Bar-Jesus, calling himself the son of Jesus. He had adopted Jesus' name for what he was doing. And for that, Paul asked that he be blinded. Jesus warned us about the false prophets, Luke 6 and verse 26. Just two verses here, verses 26 and 27. Jesus said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Notice the juxtaposition of those two terms. Beware of the false prophets, but I say to you, love your enemies. Now, there's some problem with the false prophets and love from what Jesus had to say. Matthew 7 and verse 15. And quite a bit of Matthew 7 will be going through that. Matthew 7 and beginning in verse 15. Be on your guard against false prophets. They come to you looking like sheep. Think about that. They look like one of us on the outside, but on the inside they're really like wild wolves. You'll know them by what they do. Thorn bushes do not bear grapes, and briars do not bear figs. A healthy tree bears good fruit, but a poor tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a poor tree cannot bear good fruit. And any tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So then, and this is an inset in what Jesus is talking about there, talking about the false prophets. Look at their fruits. Look at what they do, not what they say. You will know the false prophets by what they do, not just from what they say, because they're disguised. Disguised as one of us, and they don't want to scare the sheep away because they want to carve out for themselves a following out of the body of Christ. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When the judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. Look at the context there. False prophets. This is who Jesus is talking about, people who will perform miracles in His name and speak about the Word of God, and yet they are false because of the things that they do. Not necessarily where you can see them, the, the, the things that happen around them. When the judgment day comes, uh, excuse me, I already said that one. Verse 24, So then, anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain poured down, the rivers flooded over, and the wind blew hard against that house, but it did not fall, because it was built on rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them, instead they follow the false prophet, whatever he says instead, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain poured down, the rivers flooded over, the wind blew hard against that house, and it fell. And what a terrible fall that was. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at the way he taught. Jesus warned us that many are going to be fooled by the false prophet. And I don't want anyone hearing this to be fooled by a false prophet. It is not important what they say. 
It's not important that they can do signs or miracles. All too often in the Church of God, we've looked for signs and miracles. That's not the sign to look for. The sign to look for is what do they say that's out of the Word of God and what is the fruit of what they do. If they have erected a, a system that carves out a following that splits up the very Church of God, that tells the, church, the brethren that they cannot fellowship with other brethren, they have exhibited the tendencies of a false prophet. And sadly, there are some who have very high positions in the Church of God who have done that and continue to do that this very day. But Jesus warned us that many are going to be fooled by that. Matthew 24, 11, Jesus says, Then many false prophets will appear and fool many people, such that the spread of evil, uh, such will be the spread of evil that many people's love will grow cold. And that's against the command of Jesus to love one another, isn't it? So there's part of the fruit you can look for. If their love towards their brethren grows cold, there's something wrong with the fruit. But whoever holds out to the end will be saved. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached through all the world for a witness to all people. Then the end will come. There are, I think, several false prophets who claim to be doing this, this preaching this good news about the kingdom to all the world. They're not doing that. They completely ignore the prophecy at the end where the two witnesses are in Jerusalem for three and a half years. And what do you think they're going to be talking about? They're going to be talking about the good news of the coming kingdom. And they're going to be calling down uh, problems on those who come up against them for three and a half years. But they're going to be speaking about the kingdom of God. They have to be. That is the good news of, the, of, of what Jesus came to talk about. And how we know that's the, the fulfillment of this prophecy? It's because we can read the whole world will see them. That's the fulfillment of that prophecy. Not some work that's, that's claiming to be doing this, uh, spreading the gospel to the entire world, and yet carving out a, a brethren away from the rest of the brethren, making a division in the church of God. False prophets come in many forms. If you want to turn to Mark 13, and verse 10, one of them is to take, take us down a path not intended by God. For instance, the idea that we need to, to milk the brethren to create a television or radio broadcast, to, to do international magazines, to buy jets or Steuben crystal, and all the other extravagances that marked a, one of the formal, former uh, churches of God. Those things were not of God. They didn't get the gospel preached. It wasn't the preaching of the gospel at all. Mark 13, 10. And the gospel must be first be published among all nations. That word published there, uh, it's keruso, and it means to herald. Now, I don't know how much history you guys know, but if you, know, if you can go back to the, the early founding of the country and think about the town crier, and you remember the, about the town crier? Well, he would stand out in the middle of the town square, and he'd have a board on him typically, and he was dressed in a special way, and he'd have a bell, and he'd be ringing the bell, and he would make the pronouncements of the news, typically from the court. And he would tell, be telling everybody what the news was out of the, 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 the business of the local uh, uh, jurisdictions. So that's what that word means, that the gospel has to be gotten out that way. It's, it's, a, it's past word of mouth. Acts 10 and verse 37, and the same word is used there, Keruso. That word... I say you know, which was published, K. Russo, throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. So how was it published back then? Jesus went around with it, didn't he? He went from place to place speaking of the, the good news of the kingdom of God. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, verse 38, with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. There is a true prophet of God. He speaks about the kingdom of God and he does good. That's his fruit. Acts 13 and verse 47 and 48 and 49. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, 
that thou should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region, Caruso. So what happened? The word of the Lord was taken mouth to mouth by people who were in the church to tell other people. Okay. Matthew 24 again. Jesus tells us that false Christs and false prophets will have the power to do many things to deceive. And that's the whole purpose about it. It's all about deception. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall be arise false Christs and false prophets. Remember, bar Jesus, son of Jesus, false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive even the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. Therefore, if they shall say to you, he's in the desert, don't go to the desert. Or behold, he's in the secret chambers, he's hidden away, but I know where he is. Don't believe it. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even out of the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And that word lightning there is the Greek word estrape, and it just means a, a, a lightning or a glare or shining, a bright shining light. And we all know who the bright shining light that comes from the east to the west will be. That's going to be our Savior returning to, to put away the false prophets and false Christs. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, and we'll be spending a lot of time here now. The false prophets' deceptions are not to bring love. That's one thing to always remember, to look at their, their fruit. They do not bring love. They do not bring unity in the church. They bring instead destruction and separation. They, they carve the body into parts, and that's not what Jesus Christ wanted. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, speaking of Israel, even as there will be false teachers among you, who secretly will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their pernicious ways. Not just a couple. Many will follow. And because of them, the way of truth will be evil spoken of. As an aside, it just popped into my head just now. After Worldwide went down, there were, I would say, roughly half of the brethren that were attending who went that way. They, they, they went with the ways of going back to the world, what it amounted to, the, the, back to the Sunday teaching. And when you spoke to them about keeping the Sabbath, God's way was evil spoken of. This, this prophecy was coming true right in, in, in our ears. We couldn't speak to them about obeying God without them saying, oh, that stuff's nailed to the cross. Just ask Pastor Joe. He'll tell you. And what happened? The church was carved into pieces by those who wished to walk in the way uh, that Christ laid out for us and those who wished to go back to them like the dog to the vomit. They accepted immediately what they were told, and they didn't go with what they had learned for years and years and years. It's sad. And through covetousness, verse 3, covetousness, they will use you for gain with well-turned words. They sound so good. For whom judgment from of old does not linger and their destruction does not sleep. For if God did not spare sinning angels, but thrust them down into Tartarus, and deliver them into chains of darkness, being reserved to judgment. And he did not spare the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth one, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. He condemned them with an overthrow, setting an example to men intending to live ungodly. And he delivered righteous lot, oppressed with the lustful behavior of the lawless, for that righteous one living among them, 
in seeing and hearing, his righteous soul was tormented from day to day. When we hear or see the false prophets, we should be tormented because we see what they're doing to the body of Christ. He was tormented with their unlawful deeds. Verse 9, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust from a day of judgment to be punished. For a day of judgment to be punished. And especially those who walk after the flesh in the, in the lust of uncleanness and despise dominion. They are darers, self-pleasing, not trembling at glories, speaking evil. But they sound good. They sound like the lamb, remember? But they're not the lamb. Where angels, who are greater in power and might, do not bring a reproaching accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as unreasoning, natural, brute animals, have been born for capture and corruption. Speak evil of the things that they do not understand, and they will utterly perish in their own corruption. Being about to receive the wages of unrighteousness, deeming indulgence as pleasure in the daytime, and reveling in spots and blemishes, feasting along with you in their deceits. And I mentioned Ezekiel 8 earlier. If you turn back and look, read through Ezekiel 8 and find out the setting there, you'll see that it is the temple of God. And it is an end time prophecy. So if there is no stone and brick and mortar temple in the end time, what's being said there? And this is talking about people inside the church, hiding inside the church, who are doing all kinds of unclean things. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and never ceasing from sin, alluring unstable souls, having a heart exercised with covetousness. They are cursed children who have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And we all know who Balaam was, right? He's the one that had to be spoken to by a donkey to get him right. He wanted to curse Israel, but God didn't want Israel cursed. But had reproof of his law-breaking, a dumb ass speaking in a man's voice held back the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Now what use is a well without water? It's no use, is it? It's a hole in the ground, isn't it? Right? A well without water is of no use. Clouds driven with a tempest for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lust of the flesh by unbridled lust the ones who are escaping from those who live in error. Promising them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom anyone has been overcome, even to this one he has been enslaved. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the full knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled, they have been overcome by these, and the last are worse than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have fully known the way of righteousness than fully knowing to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. That's a pretty, pretty damning indictment, isn't it? We don't want to be that false prophet, and we really don't want to be paying attention to those false prophets because they have, they have good words. We can't look for the words. We have to compare them to the Scripture and let the Scripture be the words. Galatians 5. The twisting of salvation works to requirements, uh, salvation to works requirements, excuse me, will be one of the false teachings and doctrines. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with which Christ has made us free, and do not again be held with the yoke of bondage. Liberty. Christ has called us the liberty, not bondage. If we were sitting in a, in a, in a church group, and we're not here by any stretch of the imagination, I, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the darts and all the work they've done over the years. They have done so much to bring the church of God together. It's, it's a, a pleasure to be actually be up here and speaking to you because I admire the darts so much. And I'm honored to be up, actually up here. But I'm speaking of people who go in and, and, and they, they tell brethren things like, you can't go meet with that group over there because they're not part of our group. Or you can't speak to your family because we've disfellowshipped them. So you, if you talk to them, we're going to put you out too. 
There's no love in that. Nothing at all. And yet that happens even today. It's sad. Behold, I, Paul, verse 2, say to you that if you are circumcised, then Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, is Paul saying that circumcision is a prop problem? No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is that if you think circumcision will save you, that's a problem because you are saved by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that will save you. And I'll give you an example of that. I gave a message some time ago when my, my children and sort of grandchildren were in the congregation, and I took out uh, two silver dollars and I laid them on the podium, and I asked the two daughters who were there, grandchildren, come up and get those. And they were a little reluctant to get up in front of the group, you can imagine, but uh, they, I finally convinced them to come up and get them, and they got them and took it back. And I asked which of, which of those girls earned those silver dollars. Well, neither of them earned it, did they? But they still had to do something to get them, didn't they? And that's what we're talking about here. We can't earn the, the silver dollar, the salvation that God is giving to us. But when we've been called and washed up and cleansed by the blood of Christ, we still have to do something. And that is to re continually repent and stay away from sin. Galatians 5, verse 3 now. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to do all the law. You who are justified by the law are deprived of all effect from Christ, you who fell from grace. I think Paul's talking a little bit tongue-in-cheek because he, in other places, tells you you're justified by the blood. He knew that you're justified by the blood. So he's a little tongue-in-cheek there saying, well, if you're justified by the law, you have no need of Christ. But no one could be justified by the law. What did the law bring with it? Death. Because you, you, you broke the law, you were, you were guilty, and you were worthy of death. That's exactly what it meant. So he's a little tongue-in-cheek here when he says, well, you were justified by the law, you're deprived of all effect of Christ, you fell from grace. For we through, or we, you fell from the graciousness of God, is what it should be translated. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness out of faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any strength. There's his point. It doesn't matter. Circumcision or not has any strength, at least circumcision of the body. Paul in another place speaks of circumcision of the heart. That's what we should be having. Verse 7, you were running well. Who hindered you that you do not obey the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. So he's, he's addressing a false prophet right now. A little leaven leavens all the lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will think nothing else but that he troubling you shall bear the judgment, whoever he may be. And I, brothers, if I yet proclaim circumcision, why am I still per persecuted? Then the offense of, of the cross has ceased. I wish that those causing you to doubt would cut themselves off. That's a, an odd phrase. Paul isn't saying that they should disfellowship themselves. That word, uh, uh, that phrase, will cut themselves off or should cut themselves off is um, apocopto, and it means to amputate. So he's telling them to cut off something. Verse 13, as we go on, we see that the false doctrines are used to cause division. That's what the false prophets come up with. As for you, my friends, you were called to be free. And that's what the way of God is. It's freedom. It's liberty. It's a simple set of laws that they were amplified by Jesus Christ. Love one another. If you just love one another, you're not going to do the things that are in the Ten Commandments. You won't get close enough to them to, to break them. As for you, my friend, you were called to be free, but do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. So instead of fo focusing on the false doctrines of the false prophets and teachers, go back to the commandment of love. Go back there. Look at the fruits and say, is that loving? Is what I'm doing loving? Is what's going on there loving? If it is loving, that's a good fruit. If it is not loving, it's not a good fruit. And you consider the source of, uh, could possibly be one of those false prophets we're talking about. 
For the whole law, verse 14, is summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you act like wild animals, hurting and harming each other, then watch out or you'll completely destroy one another. What I say is this. Let the Spirit direct your lives, and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants. These two are enemies, and this means you cannot do what you want to do. If the Spirit leads you, then you're not subject to the law. If the Spirit leads you. You don't fall under the penalty of the law. Verse 19. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions, in worships of idols and witchcraft. People become enemies and they fight. Sounds like Paul's living today, doesn't it? They become jealous and angry and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. Wow. Paul could just as easily have written that about us today. They're envious. They get drunk, have orgies, and do other things like these. I warn you now, as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. So while we have certain individuals who claim to be preaching about the kingdom of God, and yet doing these very things within the church of God, they will not be in the kingdom of God. And there it is, Paul plainly says it. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. And verse 16 through 21. I put all these down because it leads up to the last verse, which is really the point. Have joy at all times. Keep on with your prayers. In everything give praise, for this is the purpose of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not put out the light of the Spirit. Do not make little of the words of the prophets. Let all things be tested. Keep to what is good. Hold on to what's good. Don't let that go. John said the same thing. If you read in, uh, if you turn over to 1 John 4 and beginning in verse 1, he was, John was inspired to write about, about the same thing. My dear friends, do not believe all who claim to have the Spirit, but test them to find out if the Spirit has come from God. For many false prophets have gone out everywhere. Many false prophets. And, and that's today just as well. We have to be aware of that. This is how you'll be able to know whether it is God's Spirit. Anyone who acknowledges that Jesus Christ came as a human being has the Spirit who comes from God. And we have people in the church that say otherwise. There are teachers in the church of God today. I'm not going to point them out. But just be aware that if they teach against this particular scripture, John is saying who they are. Verse 3, but anyone who denies this about Jesus does not have the Spirit from God. The Spirit that he, that he has is from the enemy of Christ. You heard that it would come, and now it's here in the world already. But you belong to God, my children, and have defeated the false prophets, because the Spirit who is in you is more powerful than the Spirit in those who belong to the world. These false prophets, or those false prophets, speak about matters of the world. And the world listens to them because they belong to the world. But we belong to God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever does not, belong, does not belong to God does not listen to us. This then is how we can tell the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Dear friends, let us love one another. There it is. Let us love one another. Let's not find a way to carve it up differences between each other. So what if one believes a little differently? Do they worship God? Do they keep the Sabbath day and keep God's commandments? Are they trying not to sin? That's what's important. Are they showing you that, and, and those around them that they love? Is the love of God being shed abroad in their heart? The fruits will show you. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed his love for us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. This is what love is. It, it, it is not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Dear friends, if this is how God loved us, then we should love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in union with us, 
and His love is made perfect in us. We are sure that we live in union with God and that He lives in union with us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and tell others that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If we declare that Jesus is the Son of God, we live in union with God and God lives in union with us. Skipping down to verse 20, if we say we love God but hate others, if we carve out division, we find ways to make people be separate, if we give them rules and, and things to go by that are not in the scripture, we are liars. For we cannot love God whom we have not seen if we do not love others whom we have seen. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? What do I need to do? Revelation 12 and verse 17. It's not my job to go to wherever the, these guys are and to point it out to them. God has not given me that calling. But I am warning so that everyone will be aware that these people exist out there today and they are carving, they are carving the church up. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is the remnant of her seed? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What's Jesus Christ's testimony? That you love one another. That was what he said. Love one another. John 13, verse 34. That's where the, the testimony of Jesus was. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. As I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love towards one another. John 15 and verse 12, continuing on the same thought. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that the man, the man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. He's speaking to me. All of us, we are his friends. He laid down his life for us, for me. I needed it. I still need it. But we're his friends if we do whatever he commands us. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. There's your testimony of Jesus Christ. Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Love one another. False prophets have long existed. They have. They're almost from the very beginning, they've existed. They've gone in and, and taught kings wrong messages, things that did not come from God or things that were false messages sent from God to deceive because they were false prophets. We need to recognize that they still exist today, and we need to recognize their tactics. And their tactics are division, deception, carving up the church, their tactics are anything but love. We are the living and walking gospel right now. We're to preach it by being a city on the hill that everyone can see. The light shining in a room of darkness. That love has to be shed abroad through our hearts. That's what the gospel message is about. We have to be a living and walking gospel for those in the world around us. We shouldn't be deceived by false prophets. Remember, Jesus said, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. It's not possible. Why? Because we know that anything that's not of love, that's against the, the commandments of God, is not of God and is false. It's pseudo. Don't support people who are false prophets. Help those who need help the most, who are in need most. That's how we let our, our light shine abroad. We should analyze what we hear and let no man deceive us. If what we hear is not unambiguous and directly from the scripture, then we need to reject the teaching for certain 
if it's not directly from the Scripture, and it's not an unambiguous, it's a direct falsehood, we need to reject it. If possible, if at all possible, we should remove that, decide, uh, that divisive teacher. Finally, we need to love God, Jesus, and our brethren, and not allow ourselves to be distracted by the doctrines of uh, uh, potential false prophets because they're there. They're there today. What Jesus said would happen has come to pass. They are out there and they're in great number. Once we get past keeping the commandments and loving our brethren, there isn't really much left that would be able to divide us.